Welcome back to Exquisitely Aligned. I'm Gina Meyer Vincent, the host and your personal soul shifter, here to help you define and design the future you desire and deserve. The one where essentially you become exactly what's missing in the world. And today I'm excited to welcome back Darcy Rogers because she has exquisitely aligned and has become the change we all need in the world, especially for our children. Darcy Rogers is the founder of Organic World Language, also known as the acronym OWL, and began developing the methodology in 2003 her work is based on second language acquisition research, student motivation, neuroscience, and best teaching practices. She taught Spanish for 16 years in high school and college, which I commend you because I wouldn't have lasted a half hour in her time at the high school level. She worked developing and creating schools. Since 2011, she has been presenting at national conferences and working with schools, teachers, and students to implement OWL values, strategies, and techniques internationally. Welcome back, Darcy. I'm so excited because I know last time we had so many things to talk about that we said we have to meet again. So thank you for accepting that invitation and making time for us today. Oh, I'm so excited to be back. We got going last time and it was so fun to see what directions we could go and things we could talk about. So this is such a treat to be back with you again. So thank you. Thank you. So I wrote just a few words. Oh because I, I think that's all we need, honestly, um, mm -hmm. because what we discovered last time in episode 70 is that so many of our beliefs that we each have personally and professionally overlap. Mm -hmm. And oh, I have goosebumps as I say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they overlap in such a way that we can see, you know, I would say into the future of how this brings just um, a, a better life for so many people. And honestly, I was talking about you last night. Your ears may have been ringing. We were eating delicious Lebanese food in Long Beach with friends who were in from out of town. She is also a teacher. She speaks uh, Lebanese and English or Arabic and English, and um, and uh, uh, her children are now learning Spanish. So this is their third language. And I was telling them all about you and that we were meeting again. So I believe she's listening to the pod uh, podcast episode 70 right now as we speak because uh, I had sent it to her. But the four words that I had written down were connection, mm -hmm. curiosity, transformation, and empowerment and the whole idea that your teachings are around student driven and changing the way the classroom looks and feels why don't you give so if someone hadn't listened to episode 70 yet give us a recap of what does that mean to be student driven learning yeah, absolutely. Great, great question. Uh, one thing that we talk about a lot within the OWL community and within the trainings and things that we do is this phrase, put it on the student. And a lot of times when we're teaching, you know, I spent a lot of time in the classroom and then a lot of these strategies came from seeing kids being disengaged, feeling unfulfilled myself when I was teaching. And I really wanted to change that dynamic. And so yeah. flipping that on its head and having the focus on listening to the students paying attention to what the students want to talk about, how it connects to the content, to the curriculum, really putting the students at the center of it. And so, so many of our strategies were developed with that in mind. And, and when you employ them, it happens. The classroom transforms. And I love that the word transformation is on here because it's a transformation of mindset. It's a transformation of the heart, honestly, bringing more joy into the classroom. So, yeah. Yeah. I love it. So I'm writing notes. Um, so many things. I, 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 being seen and heard. Those are two things that I love promoting, especially here on the show. I think that I had a conversation with the gentleman yesterday said, oh, you adopted your daughter. I adopted my daughter. She's 26. Well, Sonia turns 18 today. But so we have a few years difference, right? But we were comparing notes and he was explaining how he learned, which mm -hmm. is so true, that his daughter was adopted out of an orphanage in a foreign country where many kids would cry 
and nobody would receive the attention or acknowledgement when they were crying. And so he and his wife were taught and explained and how to handle a child who's coming out of that situation. Thankfully, my daughter was in a home being cared for um, with not only a mom and dad, but two sisters and a, a little boy who was probably on her beck and call, right? The minute she smiles or cries, he was probably there. But um, I think so many children, not just in the high school and college level, are feeling unseen and unheard. And I love the fact that how you brought in being just dis feeling disengaged or being disengaged because they're not feeling seen and heard would probably be the better way to say it. Um, so what does, what did that look like and feel like? Cause I can't even imagine when you have 30 faces looking at you with that, or maybe a portion of the 30 or even 20 looking at you with that, what are you t trying to tell me now? Or what do you think you're going to teach me? You know? Yeah. I think a big piece of the, the foundation of everything we do is building relationships and building community. And so mm -hmm. really looking at every single person in that room, every single child, whatever, whether they're five or they're 25 or 55, right. <laughs> it's coming in on each student. And I love the word curiosity is in our list yeah. because as a teacher that every kid that walks in that door, I'm curious. I have yes. so about them. I want to know about them. What makes them tick? What makes them happy? What food do they hate? Whatever it is. And right. I, Spanish, so I could very easily tie that into the content. But what we're seeing yes. is that with any subject you teach, math, science, whatever, there's a, there's an inroad, right? Finding out, having our kids know that we care about them and who they are as people yes. actually leads to them learning more and understanding the content better. So there are so many connections into this. And for me, my journey involved um, a lot of research. Um, every year, I would I'd basically have a theme that I investigated and researched. Mm. For example, neuroscience was one one year. And I discovered that the number one factor in retention is movement. So mm -hmm. I'm going to have a classroom kinesthetic, right? So yeah. that, that involved changing up the physical space of my classroom. So right. another piece of that is that when you have desks in the classroom and these rows, there's two things that are happening. One, students are in isolation. So it's harder for them to cross over into the engagement piece of class because they right. have phones, they have all these things. But if you take the desk away <laughs> and you begin to play with the physical space in the classroom, then suddenly, one, there's a higher level engagement. Two, you're able to move around more. You're able to include that kinesthetic piece. And then yes. you can see each other. And it allows for more communication to happen, which is what we want. Yes. In a language classroom, we want more discourse. We want students communicating in the target language. And one of my favorite things I like to ask when I go into any um, event or something is how many people took a second language in high school and how many people still remember it today. And almost <laughs> nobody does because of how yeah. it was taught. And so I want to change that dynamic and make it to where the classroom is a communicative space. Students are learning about each other. Language is relationship. Language is communication. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. all these things are connected. Curiosity, connection, empowerment, transformation. Um, that's what we want. We want the teachers to be empowered so the students can feel empowered. Yeah. And I think that's something that, um, you know, crosses over into everything. I love that you said you're curious about every child that walks in the room, every student. That's the way I leave my house. You know, my <laughs> husband's like, I don't know. Now she's going to talk. We'll leave for a three mile walk in the neighborhood. And he's like, oh, no, now there's someone coming. She's going <laughs> to want to know everything about this woman and her dog. You know, oh, here we go. I know she wanted to meet that big St. Bernard, you know, and we're going to. But for me, I find people and the way they think, act, move. I find them fascinating. And I love talking to people and I'll shop and buy mm -hmm. pieces of like a purse or a piece of clothing or something that I know is a, um, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, it, it breaks that, you know, where somebody wants to come and tell you or ask, Are, is that purse made out of soda pop tops? Yeah, it is. You want to touch it? You know, an like icebreaker, right? Yeah. And I think that we are so, we so crave connection as humans, it's known, but yet even though we have the internet and cell phones and 
Apple watches and things that well, I obviously I don't, but people do. My mom, my mom answers her phone in the garden, you know, on her watch. Um, sometimes I wonder if I'm the old lady and she's the young hip chick. But, um, you know, it, but yet we feel disconnected. And I love when you're talking about the desks being in the way. There are so many things these devices held in our hands get in the way because it's very easy for somebody who might be shy or intimidated to pretend they're on their phone so that they avoid somebody asking them a question. And I think COVID didn't or the being locked down or whatever the words are didn't help. I think it hurt us. So I love that you're moving the desks. And what did you notice? Uh, I mean, I can only imagine what you noticed. I, I like sitting on the floor. So I would have been all for like, yay. <laughs> so the, as the journey happened and we began playing with the space, um, the second that we got rid of those desks and put them on the outside and formed a circle, then that really transformed everything. It, we're all on the same level playing field. It's equity. So our values in OWL are equity and relationships proficiency, which is what you can do with whatever subject you're teaching, um, engagement and empowerment. And yeah. so that equity piece with that space is really important because the teacher is not the front of the room delivering. They're in the space with the students. They're encouraging conversation. They're, they're getting, they can, you can hear the kids better. And also each student yes. in the room now becomes a teacher of each other, right? Yeah. So that's a really big piece of that. And one thing I want to address that you mentioned earlier, also with that connection piece, is that we've gotten a lot more interest from districts, especially after COVID, because we focus a lot on social and emotional learning. And it's built yes. into our infrastructure of what we do in the classroom. And so students are relearning how to yeah. <laughs> talk to someone. So we have like a pairings and groupings thing where they go up and they have to talk to someone, greet them, a high five, a fist bump, you know, something, a handshake, whatever, <laughs> say something to them. They're looking each other's eyes. So we're really teaching how to be social how to maintain contact, how to be human. So that's a really beautiful yeah. part of what's happening, almost as like a side effect, but an intentional one <laughs> in the classroom. And that builds trust and that builds community. Yeah. So students can learn more. It's exciting. I, well, the other thing I want to go back for a half a second, because that that has so much. See, this could be a definite <laughs> mini series, Darcy. You're going to have to put me Sorry. on your calendar. <laughs> Lock me in. Yeah. Um there's no front and back of the room, mm -hmm. right? Uh, now that I'm married to Mark Vincent, I my children are at the end of the alphabet. So if they're seated alphabet, if they're forced, they're in the back. Mm -hmm. My main name is Maya, right? So middle of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, and it's, um, I love that, that equity goes mm -hmm. so far. And I think mm -hmm. it's something that can keep children from maybe bullying or feeling less than or feeling better than or you know so many things yeah i mean the what you started when you started it did you think that it would ha have such a did you know and feel and think that it would have such a ripple effect Absolutely not. I, in my uh, when I first started it, and we came, came back with the, the the first six student goals, I had no idea. I just knew I wanted change in my classroom. I knew I wanted transformation. I knew I wanted something different. And then I luckily was in the spaces. Thank you to Bob King to the schools that I was at that allowed me to be able to have the space to do what yeah. I was doing and do the, what looked crazy. They looked like crazy things. <laughs> And they were like, go for it. We're seeing great results, right? Go for it. Um, and I mentioned this last time also, but it was only because of other teachers in my school that were curious, that were humble, that were empathetic, that wanted to see what this could look like, that this went anywhere beyond the four walls of the classroom. Um, another teacher, Tess Miller, or Tess Seymour, actually approached me and um, she saw data. And the data was different. You know, things were happening in my class that were different than hers. And she's like, what's happening in there? And I said, I don't know. Let's go. And so <laughs> all my teachers, we did an action research project. And for two years, we met once a week and investigated what can this look like for all students and for all teachers. Yeah. And then that's how it grew from there. And it would have never left the classroom, um, that school, except that my principal forced me <laughs> to present at a conference. Um, and then word kind of started spreading and it's all yeah. just spread by word of mouth. So it's a really beautiful community of teachers that are trying things out. We say fail forward. Um, yes. Yes. Out, like, how it works. We improve the strategies. We build on it. 
Um, and it's all with the same goals of creating those connections in class, creating empowerment, uh, creating transformation. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That was it. <laughs> you know, I get very excited. You can I see I'm it, I, my, I write my notes and then I'm jumping mm -hmm. in. Um, so, so many things just to pause there for a half a second on, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Darcy, I commend you for what you do and what you started with. And I believe um, that when we align with our gifts and know something to be true within ourselves and we start to explore and share those gifts and without um attachment to the outcome mm -hmm. let's say mm -hmm. and without um doing it in a way like i'm better than anybody oh my class is the best my students are learning at rapid speeds you know no you know you just were doing what you saw a change, right? That needed to happen that what we were, I would like to say in the box format, like this is how you set up the classroom. This is where the teacher stands, these rules and roles. But when we realize what we have in ourselves, I believe always people come out of the woodwork to support you. Just like the principal, the teacher, everyone who, you know, and I think sometimes people worry, not you, but I think sometimes people think, okay, I have this great idea, but I can't do it by myself. Don't ever worry about that is what I want to say. If you're listening now and you're thinking, oh, but Darcy had all these connections. She had these connections from the fabulous people because she was doing what she knew was true and what was relevant and what was needed and what had a um, positive change. Like you said, connection, community, what were the other words? Transformative, empowerment, equ uh, equity, then the proficiency factor, engagement, of course, right? Mm -hmm. So um, j I just had to say that because you're the perfect example of what I like to say is exquisitely aligned. When we do all of that, Everyone wants to come out of the woodwork and and support and support in big ways. Two celebrities came out to support Andrea Powell. She is the um, founder of a 501c3 Corona Rising. Mm -hmm. And um, she's the author of Believe Me. She helped. She's an advocate for. Um, oh, goodness. Um uh, human trafficking. That's a word that never pops to the forefront of my mind because it's, it's just unbelievable that it happens. I think that's why I can't remember the word, but, um, two celebrities just came out and got wind of what she was doing. That's how powerful this ripple effect is. And I now, I know you're also international now, which is super, super exciting, but let's get back to failing forward. Yeah. So I do a lot of energy testing with my one-on-one -on -one, um, concierge clients. And typically when you ask the body, show me a yes, show me a no, many times a no is falling backwards. And oftentimes if you think of somebody passing out, they fall backwards. And you're always trying to catch them so that they don't hit their head on the way down if you're aware that they're fainting, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Failing forward, I like to show my clients that it is your yes. Mm -hmm. And I never see it as a fail, you know. So can you explain? That's how I see it. And I know everybody has different ways of sharing what that means. Um, so I'm glad you. I wrote a big circle around it. Failing <laughs> forward. Yes. And that's a really big component of what we do. Um, we have these six student goals and I shared them in episode 70 as well. And yeah. one of them is to take risks and to make mistakes. And so deliberately, intentionally, you cannot learn unless you make mistakes. And coming from a world language background, in order to learn a language, you, you have to make mistakes. You will look <laughs> silly sometimes. You will say the wrong thing. You have to create a safe space in class so that they can make mistakes. They can feel frustrated and lean into it. And it's OK. So when they leave that room, they'll know what will happen out there you know, in the real world where they're in a situation. Um, and I think I shared this last time, but it's such a great story that when I, it, this was born because I first took students to another country and they did not want to speak the language. And that 
that was disheartening for me. I came back and I wanted to change the way my space felt and looked. And then I went back later after employing these practices. And I think I shared this last time that kids, we were like, you can't just talk to strangers on the street. Like they were seeking out opportunities. Yes. <laughs> transformation from fear. And one of our other principles is to be fearless. So take yes. risks, make mistakes, be fearless. Um, and you mentioned earlier, I wanted to circle back to this also, yeah. that idea of empowerment. Um, and the goal with OWL in our classrooms is that you mentioned this work of being exquisite and being aligned. And that's what we really want for our teachers. So mm -hmm. that they leave every single training, we have something called boot camp in the summer. And mm -hmm. teachers are so empowered because we just want to help you, you know, the teacher, find your authenticity, find yeah. your exquisiteness, right? Um, well, and they go in, you go into that field, not me, but you and each of them go into that field knowing that they have, in my opinion, it's a calling to be a teacher. I, I don't think people go into it for the money, right? Um, or at least not in our country. But um, I think that those people who go into teaching, they, they want to change the world. They are world changers. They know they're touching so many lives. I had somebody recently, I can't remember who it was. Oh, uh, at U of A this weekend, uh, we took Sonia to see U of A for architecture. And the woman said, I don't have my own children. I have many of your children and I'm blessed to do the work I do. And she was probably closer to retirement age, had been there for quite some time and just you could tell how passionate she was, you know, about teaching. And so I love that you're empowering them and, and not, I think sometimes the classroom setting, the typical standard classroom setting is for me stifling personally. Like I, the minute I walk in with all the rows, I'm like, <laughs> we were talking about that before. <laughs> It's a different, it is a different feeling when you walk into certain spaces. And that is something we talk about. One thing we wrote down too, was that managing the energy or managing yes. the space and that it can feel different when you walk into a space. And what I've noticed when I walk into classrooms that are employing a lot of these strategies is that there's a palpable difference. You can feel the yes. connection. You can feel the energy. You can feel the positivity. Um, it's exciting to go in and see students talking and interacting in the target language and listening to each other. And, you know, there are three expectations that we have um, with an OWL and it's respect, um, community or family. And then mm -hmm. in this case, in the target language, like trying to create that immersive space. Um, mm -hmm. But it would be say that you're teaching math, it would say to be a mathematician, be a scientist, yeah. right? A historian. Yeah. So really entering into that space and, and you know, embodying what that is. Um, and that, that, those are three expectations. It's simple, um, but that is, that is what I want to experience and feel when I walk into a classroom. Um, well, and I think that it is oftentimes we go to events. I went to an event the other night and I went in with certain expectations and you and I had this conversation and I came out and my expectations were, it, were not what I was, or my experience was, didn't align with my expectations. And I came out like, Oh, that was a bit weird, you know, from the shape of the room or, or the way the tables were in the room to some of the conversations, etc. And I think when you can give a teacher, empower them with the expectations, when you can give the students, these are the expectations in our room, in our room, and there's only three, right? It's not like, oh, she has 20 rules. Which rule are we going to be following today? Yeah. And a piece of that also is that we're we're building community together. So I call it in language, it's co-creating language and co-creating communities. So we're actually setting standards and expectations that we as a community agree on. So I'm not imposing any rules, right? We, yeah. we as a community are deciding what we value, what's important. There are mm -hmm. those like three non-negotiables. And then from there, we talk about what does trust look like? What do we want the space to look like? And the yeah. students, we are doing that together as a community. And so I'm not really doing discipline. If something happens in class, say a kid hits someone else, right? They're joking around yeah. or something. And in, in the target language, I might say, hey, class, is that in? See or not, yeah. <laughs> right? I don't, it's not a discipline. It's okay. This is part of our, what we want for our community. Is this yeah. the expectation we have here? Is that trust? Is that respect? And so we yeah. can build that space together, which is so powerful because then the students have ownership. And that's actually one of our other values is intrinsic right. motivation and student ownership. And that, that they are empowering themselves to own that space, which yeah. is 
so much more powerful. <laughs> it is. And I think that when you give a student ownership and, and being a mother of two, right, and a boy and a girl, one biological, one adopted, and it, it, one six foot four, one four foot ten. I mean, they're so different yet so similar a, as well. Um and I know as parents, it's sometimes, and I can imagine as teachers being responsible in a classroom setting for m multiple kids that are all the same age, um, that it's hard sometimes to give ownership. And I think people fear like, oh, they're going to revolt. No, they're not going to revolt. Mm -hmm. They're going to be proud. They're going to be, they have higher expectations of themselves and each other then oftentimes we think they do. do. Do you find like, how can you explain that better than what I'm saying? Because yeah, no, I, 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 know yeah. what, I know what you mean by the ownership piece. Yeah. It's uh, trusting that we all together will create the space that we want to create. Um, I think within our structure of OWL, we developed a process called PATH. It's P-P-A-T-H. We don't have to go into it here, but yeah. that structure allows for, um, that respect to be built. Um, there's an accountability element to it. There's a mm -hmm. cognitive piece to it. Um, there's hooks involved that are relevant, that are authentic. And so students are buying in because we're tapping into the things that are important to them because we know them, because we listen to them. Um, the largest class I ever had was 45 students. The smallest I ever had was eight. So I've yeah. worked with all kinds of different spaces and the, the same values still apply. Um, it's mm -hmm. coming back to getting to know them, letting them know that you care about them. Um, and when things go wrong, because things go wrong all the time, there are days that I would go home bawling. You know, <laughs> I, I can't do this anymore. And that's just real life. Um, and we come back and we try again. You know, we have those hard conversations of what does trust look like? Are we feeling safe yeah. in this classroom? Is right. there respect here? What do we have to do to get that? So it's taking the, the time to take those deliberate, intentional conversations that lead to higher outcomes, more learning. Because once those things are in place, you just fly because students are there to support each other. Um, and it does take yeah. an element of trusting the process and trusting the students. Yes. And like you said, knowing that at the end of the day, they, they really do, you know, I've had students who were <laughs> really difficult students um, and they came back a couple of years later and apologized because they knew they were. <laughs> you know? right. well, just part of it. But when you trust them and they know what they're cared for, it might be difficult in the moment, um, but it pays yeah. off in the end, so. It does. And I think that's the biggest thing. And, it, and of course, it pays off what you're doing, what, how you're touching them pays off, as you can see, years later as well. I mean, all the things I, I mean, I've wrote, written so many notes. I don't even know if I can <laughs> um, get them in the in the correct order. But all the things that you're talking about or speaking and giving, allowing these kids to feel and experience are life skills. And I think that's one of the biggest things that I personally, and again, I am not a, a teacher. I taught yoga, but I'm not a, a school teacher at all. I had those dreams at a very young age. Then I realized that is definitely not my calling. I didn't have the patience for it, but you know, um, these skills, I think, were missing prior to OWL being around in our classrooms. And I think parents used to teach these life lessons, I believe. Um, we lived in communities. We had very much more um, of extended families, etc. I'm talking centuries ago, right? Not just yesterday, but centuries ago. And then as people started moving and now we have the internet and look, I am uh, across the country from my children's grandparents, my parents and my sister and brother, and my dad left Germany for America. So then we start spreading out and some of those like life skills started being missing. And I think when two parents are working full time and they're trying to get these kids to activities, you know, all these uh, after school sports travel teams, it's like they're missing out. So I love, 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 love mm -hmm. that you are able to bring this into the classroom through language, and I know that's expanding, or I have a feeling it's expanding. And, you know, it's, it, I commend you and all your team and everyone who says yes to 
owl's way of teaching and learning. I'm sure it's, it's people must initially, I'm guessing, are like scratching their head, wait, what? And then they, you know, are like, oh. So what has been the feedback? Like, you know, what what do you what do you hear when you explain what you do in the education world? Like when you're up speaking, are people like, yeah, wow, or do they does it take them a minute to like, oh, I don't know, <laughs> child centered? <laughs> Yeah, what's neat is that in a lot of the conferences that we go to, we have a session or something like that. And so we do the strategies. So we invite people into the space, we get in a circle, we do the activities. And so that's nice. always really fun for teachers um, to, to actually experience it, to see what it's like. And so our entire process through our trainings is exactly what I do in the classroom. I, I don't know anything different. We do the strategies, it's, it's experiential, we're building community in the space. And so everything we've done has grown through word of mouth. Uh, you know, when one teacher tries it, it's like oh, yeah. <laughs> somebody else and it's so exciting. And, you know, there's different levels of implementation. Some people use some of the strategies with the curriculum they already have. Other people are looking for a new curriculum and we adopt it completely. So there's a lot of entry points in. And at the end of the day, it really is about best practices and that student connection. So there's something for everybody, you know, something yeah. that they can latch on to. I want to learn, you know, how to engage my students more. I want to learn how to create you know, community in my classroom. I want to learn how to challenge students, my upper level students. I want to, there's a, there's an entry point for anything, you know, which is really neat. So very and accessible. I love that you, yeah. I love that you said it is, it's an experience. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when you own your own business, you get to name things, right? So within exquisitely aligned, my, um, my, uh, program that I work one-on-one -on -one with, it's an experience because mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, no, it's not a course. It's not a program. It's an mm -hmm. experience. And isn't that why we're alive, right? It is to have an experience and to think about, I always told my kids, you know, kiss them goodbye in the morning, have fun at school, you know, and because I want them to enjoy what they're doing for X amount of hours during the day. There is nothing worse than a child not wanting to get up and, and go to school um, because they don't really, in our country, there's no other option. They don't really have another option to, okay, go to work at this age. You know what I mean? Like it's part of what we're doing. So being able to give them that experience um, and allow the teachers to feel that experience before them teaching it themselves. Oh, Darcy, there is so hands on. And it's another thing is that um, it's really about joy, right? And, and play yes. and, and students. And we as teachers, we learn so much more through play. And so, you know, you can, they say it's a hundred repetitions for something, but if you do it with play, it's seven. You know? yes. it's, it's a, there's no downside to it. The build community, it's actually very rigorous. Um, and one of the huge messages that I have is just joy, to have joy yeah. in the classroom, joy as a teacher, joy with your students. And if you're laughing with your students, then there yeah. is more learning, right? There is, there oh, is totally. more engagement. And uh, so the joyful learning is a big, is a big piece of this. So I, I really appreciate you. You brought that up and brought that into it. <laughs> Well, and I love, so you said um, with play, you go from instead of a hundred repetitions to learn and let something sink in to seven. That is huge. I love math. So that, that you got my, you know, and then I had to pull my book. There's a couple different numbers. But yeah, yeah. but it, let's just say it's a huge difference. Huge. And I know from, um, now I'm going to forget the name of the movie, but there was a, uh, something in the B. She was in the spelling B. What was her name? Uh, uh, ends with an A. But there was a movie years ago about a little girl who was wanting to be in the spelling B. And then I think it was her grandfather to ta taught her to jump rope while she was spelling. So, okay, Darcy, spell alphabet. Yeah. Um, I'll text you later and tell you the name of the movie. Akila and the B. Um, it's not the bee, the animal, it, uh, the bug, it's a spelling bee. And so we watch that. And I know from public speaking that if you can make somebody laugh, mm -hmm. they're more likely to remember what you said. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so when you think about, um, oh, now I forgot his name, how it, 
what we listen to versus what we see and hear, et cetera, how we learn. I mean, yeah, if you can make somebody laugh, feel connected, feel special, feel empowered, feel like they have a vote as to what's going on in the classroom and what's important. Mm -hmm. So you said joy, I have to take out. So this is Power Versus Force by Dr. Um, R. Hawkins, which I'm not sure that Um, we talked about this last time. Uh Good, so this is another new thing. And um, on his map of consciousness, because I'm not gonna go into it a science lesson, but um, quantum physics, everything Mm -hmm. in the universe is vibrating. So you were talking about the palpable vibe of an owl set up classroom versus the traditional where I walk in and I'm like, oh, this feels so wrong in so many ways, you know? Joy is 540 uh, beats per second versus, let's go to fear, 100. Oh, wow. Um, Acceptance. (laughs) Power versus. Yes, I will. Acceptance, 350. Uh Um, Let's go to grief or guilt. Grief is 75. Guilt is 30. And the thing about more than just the number of 540 um, it's how it relates to our health. Mm -hmm. And you were speaking about bringing joy into the classroom. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's not just during that X amount of time. uh, We used to call them periods. Now, what do they call blocks? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the classroom time that I have Spanish, let's say Spanish block, but it goes on to the next class because they're still smiling. And if we can live in more joy all day long, and I know that student goes home with a smile on their face, which makes mom and dad, sister, brother, and the puppy all happy as well, because, you know, so really it's so uh, fascinating what you're doing. And um, yeah, we have so allowed into the schools as well. So say there's one classroom doing this, it's, it's so active. It's, it's responsive learning. It's active learning. And then people kind of take note, right? They, what's going on in that classroom or what's happening or, and then we even had a math teacher who chose to put herself between two Spanish teachers <laughs> because she wanted to remind herself to get her kids moving. And she started to move the space around in her classroom and her math classroom. Kids were in groups doing activities. They were had, you know, discourse happening around the math. And um, so it's, it's very much begins to affect the culture of a school yes. in a very yeah. positive way. Yeah. And so back to moving, let's talk about that for half a second or for three minutes. Um, (laughs) Moving. So I used to teach yoga, Zumba bar, paddle boarding, paddle board yoga, and they are now thankfully showing Mm -hmm. that movement at least like 10 minutes per hour Mm -hmm. versus going to the gym and working out for an hour, an hour and a half is healthier and has longer lasting. So being able to move within the classroom setting, as you can see, my hands are always moving, my Italian hands, but it is it is so important. At one point, I wish I could say he's still doing it, but my husband had a pom- Pomodoro timer, which would go off every hour for 10 minutes. He would do whatever it was, even if it was go get the mail and come back, even if the mail uh, mail person didn't <laughs> deliver yet, you know, uh, walk the dog, go do push-ups, go do um, TRX. He had, you know, little things he did throughout the day. And I think these poor children who are stuck trying to sit still, which is something my daughter cannot do. She needs to be spinning, jumping, leaping, you know, <laughs> Um, when she was younger, it was cartwheels, round offs, and now it's it's full dance uh, breakout. Mm-hmm. But um, it it does, and being able to bring that cognitive learning, meld those two things together, is something that we even need to do in our at our desks mm-hmm. as yep. uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, etc. Mm-hmm. Because. Everything you're teaching apply, in my opinion, uh, because I know you asked. No, <laughs> but everything, in my opinion, really applies to to living a joyful life Absolutely. and feeling part of a community, feeling connected, being belonging. heard and seen. What's that? Oh, is that a sense of belonging? Yes, belonging. 
feeling seen and heard, like you just said, that's crucial. belonging is huge. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think so many children, even adults feel mm -hmm. alone in the way they see and, and experience the world. I know I'm speaking for myself, but I have many clients who tell me the same that I can't talk about whatever it is, their dreams and desires, because I know I'll be judged and I don't want to be judged. And these are grown people, which breaks my heart. But I know what that feels like because they want some, they want to feel connected. They want to have a deep conversation where somebody's listening and not um, checking their phone or their Apple watch, you know, uh, oh, wait, how many texts did I miss or who do I have to connect back with? So um, I love that you're able to um, share all of this. And I really, I thank you. I'm looking at the clock now because I see my timer is flashing. Right, so, um, But I know, Darcy, there are so many other things we could go deeper. And I do want to say, um, give you time because I know you do boot camps and stuff. So mm -hmm. why don't you take a moment and tell us about some of the fun things that you do to help teachers prepare to do the things that you, we just spoke about. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So the, we, there are several different ways to interact with the community. We have virtual trainings, which are happening all the time. So you can just go to our website and see what kinds of virtual trainings are happening. And when we have everything from, you know, a one-time session to series that teachers can join that go up to 10 weeks. Um, we also have things called virtual symposiums, which are twice a year. And those are uh, mm -hmm. kind of like a quick punch. It's a three-day training that they can jump in on. It's one of our most comprehensive virtual trainings. And then we do workshops throughout the year. There's ones that we host. Um, we can come to your school. That's really awesome because we come and do activities with your students. Um, you get a chance to work with your students. That's are the best thing we do is our um, have bring us to your school. And then boot camps. We're known for our boot camps. It's our signature event. It's a week-long training in the summer. And there's actually three this summer, but there's usually at least two every summer. So you can check that out. And then we also have resources for teachers. So we have lesson plans. We have um, resources that teachers can use, that path process I described. We have a handbook for that. So mm -hmm. there's also tangible resources that teachers can access to use with their students. Um, pairings and groupings cards that help them put students into groups when you're unsure how to do it. Uh, lots of fun ways to get all these strategies and all these principles into the classroom. So the movement piece, the speaking piece, um, bringing it all together. So those are some of the ways to get involved. Oh, we also have um, Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, X, I guess it is now. Um, it's at owllanguage.com. You can find it in the show notes. Um, and so check us out. Yeah, I love it. And I'm guessing those who attend um, feel the community immediately and have uh, peers to connect with mm -hmm. when they go home and start implementing so that they can keep, hey, I had this happen. That worked beautifully. Oh, I had a hiccup here. Can you help me? You know, like sharing ideas. So um, that ripple effect is so visible when you speak. I can see it and feel it. And and that's what Exquisitely Aligned is all about, is being that change that you feel needs to happen. And just like you, Darcy, being the example of how other people come out, see you and support you. And um, I, I think you feel seen and heard. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And that's all. The only thing that I want for every teacher ever is that yeah. feel seen and heard. And the beautiful thing about the community is that it is that we've gotten so many people who have commented from the outside in going, wow, that's such an amazing community and teachers in it that are just feeling so supported um, and know that there's people that they can go to if they need it. And so, yeah, it's so important. It, I know that I always heard right when I was young, takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think it takes that village, a big community, mm -hmm. to raise a child, to support teachers, to keep a marriage together, so many things. And I, I think that's what has been messing. And that's why sometimes the, we have students failing or students, and these not are children that are not applying themselves. Mm -hmm. They just don't feel seen or heard, or they're mm -hmm. not learning in a way that is, relevant, fun, that brings joy and movement and helps them remember. So um, kudos again. I love all of that. It will be in the show notes. So if you didn't get to uh, write it down fast enough, yeah. please find it there. 
I'm going to pull a card based on when you tell me, I know you know what we do. So these are all about communication, like you being curious of people. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to know who was in my yoga studio, who was, you know, what was their favorite food, whether it be a an actual food or a type of food, mm -hmm. um, what were their desires, where did they want to travel? And so out of that came um, more questions, lots of questions, 42 uh, cards worth with three per card which I can't do the math in my head at the moment. But uh, when I start rifling through, just tell me when to stop and I'll pull the card for you. So I'm going to start. Stop. Okay. Oh, this one's perfect. Senses. <laughs> no way again. <laughs> Did we have this exact one last time? I can't I don't remember. Think so. What was it? Well, I think it was celebration, I think. Last time it was celebration, yeah. yeah. Okay, senses. So this is perfect because we we touched on this. Your five senses accentuate uh, the bliss of life, which we've been talking about joy and that palpable experience. How does smell enhance your taste? What role does taste play in nourishing your body? What sense makes you most alive? And you can answer one, two, or all three. Um, hmm. I have to ask, say those again. Um, I would say, oh, I don't know. This is an interesting one. Um, probably the sense of touch. I'm a big hugger. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, that would make sense, right? <laughs> but the, um, but I think, yeah. Um, but I really feel like all those things together, I, I go straight to the classroom, mm. of course, they can't help it. But the most that we can bring in all those senses into the classroom, into the space, the more students we can access. Um, so we'll talk totally. about actually the value of touch in the classroom. And I mean, mm -hmm. in a very appropriate way, but like a high five even, or like a yeah. you know, pinky, pinky or things that are going to start to yeah. break down barriers and make kids right. kind of connect with each other is important. And then of course, in a language classroom, we're bringing in food all the time, right? Taste and <laughs> You know, sound, um, music, bringing in all the different pieces. So I love yes. that senses was it because that really is our our teaching style is how can you incorporate all the five senses into the learning space. So that I love that one. So it's just going to have a different a different sense that means something to them. Well, and it's it's the experience, right? Yes. Back to that exactly. word. It's definitely. <laughs> I think um, having had <laughs> yes, having had two kids study in K through eight in Spanish English immersion, uh, for my son in particular, who's now six foot four, when they did the food days, that was his mm -hmm. definitely. Oh, this person's mother made the best. You need to get her a recipe. And, you know, yeah. it was always fun. And then he went on to study French. And he was always, when it was his turn to pick the event as the president, it always had to deal with food. But, yeah, um, yeah no, I think that being able to allow, because sometimes the classrooms, I always, I mean, it's, embarrassing to tell you this, but I hated parent teacher night because I didn't like being in the classroom because it was, in my opinion, too small. Um, it was, it always smelled a little bit old, you know, the books and stuff were like a little, not my, it's, it's, it's not like a homey feel. And uh, of course I couldn't stand the uh, fluorescent lighting. So I was always like, oh, here we go. We got to stand in this classroom for Lord knows how long. I wanted the information, but I didn't want to be sit, trying to squeeze into a, you know, a fifth grader's desk be, with my long legs. And um, I think that being able to move the furniture and like you said, the food, the smell of the food, the taste, it's like they're in a foreign country. And they're really feeling what it might feel like to be there. And um, so, yes, there's so many wonderful things, Darcy. That was so much fun. Thank you for what you do. It's it's so amazing. I know that it's probably not always easy, but I love the fact that people are coming out and supporting you, hearing and seeing you. And that you're causing a ripple effect, not only in our country, but around the world, because I believe education could use a little bit more excitement and especially movement and experience. So um, kudos and thank you to you. I greatly appreciate it. 
And a thank you to you. I really appreciate this chance to come out and talk. And I want to say thank you to all the teachers out there that are doing yes. good work and connecting to your students. It's um, amazing. Thank you. So, and thank yes. you for having me. This has just been so much fun. And um, look forward to seeing what we can come up with next. <laughs> yes. No, I wrote notes. So there's plenty more. I am um, plenty, plenty more. But I want to just say, and I agree with you, thank you to everyone who's in the education field from the front door to the back door and everywhere in between. It's a definite calling touching that many kids lives mm -hmm. and, and making it memorable and lasting because it really does stay with them. I, well, for my children, mm -hmm. they, uh, they really have had the fortune of having great teachers who now some of them have become friends. So um, okay. even though there's an age difference, you know, but there's a respect like you were yep. talking about and um, being able to keep that connection open. But yeah. if any of you are listening and want to step into the possibilities that Darcy has as far as being that change that you feel or that you see, and even if you have what you think is a small or a wild or crazy idea that some people, you're nodding your head, yeah, Darcy, you know, right? <laughs> that other, exactly, you and I, I think, have the yeah. same um mentality. That's why I feel so connected to you. But sometimes we might feel alone that other people don't see it the way we see it. Mm -hmm. The thing is this, if there is something burning on your heart, a heartfelt desire, I believe it needs to be expressed. And so if there's something that you're thinking about rolling around in your head, as I like to say, and you want to talk, please reach out to me, leave us a message here. Uh, your comments here in the, the, uh, on YouTube, if you're coming in through YouTube, give us a review on Apple. Until next time, be exquisite.